We now enter into our time of confession. When we gather to praise God, we remember that we are a people who have preferred our wills to his. Accepting his power to become new persons in Christ, let us confess our sin to God and to one another. We'll do so this morning with a time of silent prayer. Let us pray. Lord, we have sinned without considering how much you love us. You see our sins more clearly than we see ourselves. Lord, you know when we are indifferent to your word, the Bible. You know how often we forget to pray, the times we come unwillingly to worship, and yet we turn to you when we are in trouble. Lord, you know when we are untruthful and when we think evil of others. You see our anger and unfairness to our friends. You know how hard it is for us to forgive. Forgive us, O Lord. Make us clean so that we can obey your call to take up your cross and follow you. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. I have very good news for you this morning because the Lord hears our prayers and he forgives all our sins. Hear these wonderful words of promise from Psalm 145. The Lord is faithful in all his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all those who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
This morning is the third Sunday that Pastor Mark and I try to answer your questions about faith. This morning's three questions cover the topic of evil. So we'll discuss together why do bad things happen to good people? Does God use bad things to test us? And is it true that God will not give us more than we can handle? Let us come to God in a time of prayer. Holy God, before us this morning, we have three very difficult questions. Lord, send your spirit to open our eyes, our hearts, our minds to hear what you want us to hear this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why do bad things happen to good people? This is a tough question asked by both non-Christians and Christians. Non-Christians sometimes use the topic of evil and suffering to prove that God doesn't exist. Christians, on the other hand, ask this question because we don't understand how our good, our faithful, our loving God would allow so much evil and suffering. Now, there are many different ways to ask a question about why God allows human suffering, but this question in particular wrestles with good people suffering. Good people. But who are good people? Are they Christians? Are they anyone who does good things? Well, in our tradition, the Reformed tradition, we believe that all people are born sinful. All people. That includes those sweet, tiny, little, innocent babies. They're born sinful. In fact, the psalmist tells us in Psalm 51 that we were born, or we were sinful from the moment of conception. From the moment of conception. So it seems that humans really aren't good. They're sinful to the very core of their being. Now, not only are we born with a sinful nature, but we actively sin all the time. Theologian Herman Bovink says, humans are by nature incapable of any spiritual good, inclined to all evil, and on account of it alone deserve eternal punishment. Whew. That sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? We're incapable of doing any good, and as a result, we deserve eternal punishment. Well, Paul echoes these same sentiments in Romans 6, 23, when he says the wages of sin is death. Sinners deserve death. But then how do we come up with this idea that people are good and they don't deserve bad things. Well, humans can't do any good on their own unless God is involved. Question and answer eight of the Heidelberg Catechism says, but are we so corrupt that we're totally unable to do any good and inclined toward all evil? And the answer, yes, unless we are born again by the Spirit of God unless we're born again by the Spirit of God. So Christians, through the work of the Holy Spirit, are able to do good sometimes. But what about non-Christians? Well, in my seminary ethics class, we learned that there are three different kinds of good. There's saving good, which only God can do. There's Christian good, that Christians can do through the work of the Holy Spirit. And then there's moral good. Now, moral good is good that anyone can do. It's when one's actions conform to God's law, even if their heart might not be in the right place. 
So it seems to me that when we ask this question, why do bad things happen to good people, we aren't thinking about the fact that we're sinful and deserve death. No. We're focusing on the good that we see people doing in the world. And then on those bad things that sometimes happen to them that don't seem to match how good they are. Just take this example, for instance. A couple of weeks ago, one of my seminary colleagues and his wife got into a terrible, a terrible car accident. This morning, I'll refer to them as Rob and Lily. Now, Rob, as a result of this accident, had many different injuries, broken vertebrae, internal bleeding, punctured lungs, brain bleed, and many different fractures. And his wife, Lily, has a broken pelvis. Now, this was about three or four weeks ago, and as far as I know, Rob is stable, yet remains in the ICU, and his wife seems to be recovering all right. But when devastating things like this happen, we wonder, why? Why? Why did Rob, what did Rob and Lily do to deserve this? They're so young. They have so much to offer the world, so much to offer the church. So why, God, did you take away these weeks, these months of their life? God, why did you let this accident happen to them? And this is only one example. I'm sure each one of us could come up with a list that could go on and on. Right? Why do certain people get cancer and die? Why are some people born with disabilities? Why do babies die? Why? We know in our heads that we have a God who never leaves us or betrays us. But often we don't understand why God allows certain suffering to happen to certain people. And we aren't the only ones here this morning who have wrestled with this topic. The Bible includes a whole variety of examples and situations where people don't understand why they're suffering. In fact, the book of Psalms includes a number of psalms of lament, of moments when the psalmist cries out to God because he doesn't understand his suffering, and he wonders where God is. How long, O oh Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? Shows the very depths of the psalmist's soul. But the psalmist shows us that it's okay to cry out to God and ask him why in these moments. And while this may offer some comfort to you, it still doesn't answer our question, does it? Many, many theologians, many scholars have wrestled with this topic of suffering in God to try to come up with an answer that makes sense. Well, non-Christians quickly want to limit the attributes of God. They want to say, well, God just can't be all-knowing, or he can't be all-powerful, or he can't be all-good. Christians don't want to do that. We want to find another option. So is it possible that God is all-knowing, is all-powerful, is all-good, and yet still allows suffering? Well, the answer is yes. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely possible. Because God may allow suffering in order to achieve a greater good. A greater good doesn't really seem to make sense, does it? What could fit into the category of greater good? Well, I'm going to provide you with just a couple of different ideas to get you to continue thinking about this, but this list is by no means exhaustive. 
Right? There could be other things that could fit into this list or things we don't even know about yet that could fit into this list. Here are some examples. God may allow suffering because it's better that humans have the ability to choose to love and serve God and as a result also can choose evil instead of God making them be puppets who simply do what God makes them do. I guess this is the idea of free choice or free will. Better to choose to love and serve God than to not have that choice. Or God may allow suffering because it's better that God maintains a fallen but redeemable world instead of destroying it completely. So that has to do with God's providence in upholding the world. Or God may allow suffering in order to build godly character or virtues in us. Or God may allow suffering in order to maintain divine and human justice. Now, it's certainly possible that as you hear those four examples this morning, you think, no. None of the, I, none of the examples that come to my mind fit into any of those categories. And that's okay. That's absolutely okay. In fact, that's normal. We don't understand the wisdom and the ways of God. Yet it's possible that God has a purpose for our suffering that we don't know, or maybe we can't even understand right now. Yet even amidst our suffering, Paul reminds us of God's promises in Romans 8 when he says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him. We know in all things, and includes our suffering, that God is working for our good. Now I want to spend a couple of moments talking about how we should respond to others when they ask us this question, why did this happen to me while they're in the middle of their suffering? Well, this is absolutely not the time that we pick one of the above options or come up with an option of our own and suggest those to our friend. Right? We don't say something like, maybe God is disciplining you for something you did, or maybe God wants you to develop a specific virtue like patience. No, that's not going to be helpful in the moment. You know, it's better to say something like, I don't know why God allowed this suffering. What happened to Rob and Lily is devastating. It's devastating. And I'm so sorry. Now, there may be an opportunity in the future to discuss why God allows evil in more detail, but this is not the right time for that. Empathize with their pain and suffering, but don't try to answer their question. Questions like this one about why God allows evil to continue are very, very difficult. But please don't avoid them because they're hard. Continue to wrestle with them. Continue to read God's word. Continue to read other resources. Continue talking with others until you can either rest in an answer that works for you, or rest in your lack of complete understanding. Now, our second question this morning fits directly with the first. Does God use bad things to test us? Well, testing people's faith is a theme that comes up a number of different times in the Bible. I imagine that some of you, when you hear testing of faith, can easily come up with a couple of examples. First, we have Abraham, right? That Old Testament story where God asked Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, to prove that Abraham feared the Lord and would obey his command. Right? Then we have the whole book of Job, Job, who's introduced as a blameless, upright, faithful man, 
a man greatly blessed by God with children, servants, and animals. One day, God has a conversation with Satan, and God lets Satan have power over all Job's possessions. And Satan takes them all away, his servants, his animals, even his children. And then later, God lets Satan have power over Job's body, so Satan strikes him with a terribly painful disease. Right? These are a couple of narratives where God tests the faith of his people through physical suffering, through emotional suffering. Yet apart from biblical narratives like these ones, the Bible doesn't explicitly say that God will use suffering to test us. Yes, the Bible clearly says our faith will be tested, but it doesn't explicitly associate suffering with that testing. So does God use suffering to test his people? I don't know. I can't say I'm 100% certain yes, but I can't say I'm 100% certain no. I'd say based on biblical narratives, it's certainly possible that God could use suffering to test his people. And I could even imagine that God using suffering could be for, uh, using suffering to test us could be for a greater good. I could imagine that that could strengthen our faith, maybe. Or maybe be a witness to someone else. So I think it's possible that God could use suffering to test his people. Now on to our last question for this morning. Is it true that God will not give us more than we can handle? On multiple occasions, I've heard people say, but God won't give me more than I can handle as they talk about their suffering. But is it biblical? Is it true? Well, this phrase actually originates from one verse in Paul's letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says this. God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Now, the key word in this sentence is that Greek word that was translated in the above verse as tempted. But what makes this a little bit more difficult is that most Greek words can be translated into a number of different words and translated into a number of different ways. For instance, this word in particular could be tempted or tested. So how can we figure out whether or not he's talking about suffering or something else? Well, when we try to understand one specific verse in the Bible, it's important to look at the broader context. Okay, so in this chapter, Paul begins by listing a number of sins that the Israelites committed in the past. They worshipped idols, they committed sex sexual immorality, they tested the Lord, they grumbled against him. And as a result of their sin, they were punished. But why would Paul highlight these details for these Christians in Corinth? Well, Paul uses these examples as a warning to these Christians, a warning because it seemed that these Christians thought that they could indulge in some of those above-mentioned activities without it affecting their relationship with God. But Paul tells them, hold on. You think you're standing firm, but actually you're falling. Watch yourselves. You've been tempted to sin just like all those who lived before you. You've seen nothing new. But look to the Lord, for he is faithful. He will not let you be tempted to sin more than you are able. In fact, he'll find a way out so you can escape. It seems pretty clear that this passage warns the people 
that their sinful behavior could have devastating results. Yet it also provides comforting words that if they look to God, he will not let them be tested or tempted more than they can handle. Meaning that God will not let them fall so far that they'll lose their salvation. So we come back to our initial question. Is it true that God will not give us more than we can handle? Well, according to this passage, God will not allow us to be tempted to sin more than we can handle. But what about suffering? Couldn't Satan use suffering to tempt us to sin? Well, sure. I think Satan can use suffering to tempt us to sin. But here God promises us that at some point there will be a way out of the temptation and Satan will not win. Satan will not win. But I don't think that this means that we will not endure more suffering than we can handle. I think that there may be or will be or have been times in your life when your suffering feels unbearable. When the suffering in your life feels like more than you can handle. Then what? Well, God gives us clear promises in his word that can provide comfort in our suffering. Let's turn to Psalm 23, that well-known psalm. Right there in verse 4, it says, even though, I, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. You're with me. Now, Psalm 23 doesn't say that God will take away our suffering, even though that may be what we want to hear. Yet it reminds us that God is there. He's there with us in the shadows of death. He's there in the pit of despair. He's there in the very depths of our suffering. Now we could turn to Deuteronomy 31, verse 6. This passage takes place as the Israelites are going to take over the land that God promised to them. Moses gives them this reminder. The Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. The same promise is true for all of us as God's people. God is always with us, even in our suffering. So we have hope in the present, and we also have hope for the future. Because the world will not be like this forever. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, who already paid for our sins, he's coming back. He's coming back. And at his second coming, we will experience the full benefits of our salvation. And he will renew heaven and earth. All that's broken will be made new. There will be no more tears, no more crying, no more sadness, no more suffering, for the old order of things will pass away. We have great hope that there will be an end to our suffering. There will be an end to evil in the world. What an amazing comfort this is. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Now, brothers and sisters in Christ, I probably didn't answer all of your questions about evil and suffering in the past 25 minutes. Once we begin asking questions, there are always more. More always come. So continue asking questions. Continue talking about these difficult topics. Lean on one another and look to God for strength and support. Let us now go to him in a time of prayer. Holy and gracious God, oh, we think about this topic of evil, of suffering, and 
Lord, we heard a 25-minute message on it, and still it may not make sense. Lord, send your spirit to us as we continue to wrestle through hard questions like this one. Lord, give us the hope and the faith that we need to continue to rely on you amidst our deep suffering and pain. We pray this in Jesus' name alone. Amen. Let us rise to sing when peace like a river.